Cindy Thompson, and I will be reading from Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 7. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion, and instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in the land they have, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. Thank you, Cindy. We now transition into the renewal portion, the middle portion of our three-part service, where we corporately, as a church body, as a family, we confess our sins together. That's then followed by personal, silent confession. And then uh, the all-important, why we believe, the words of comfort, the assurance of pardon for those of us that believe in Christ. So let us now join together as we corporately confess our sins. Almighty God, who sent the promised Holy Spirit with power to fill disciples with faith, we confess that as disciples we are slow to serve you and reluctant to spread the good news of your love. God, have mercy on us. Forgive our divisions and by your Spirit draw us together. Fill us with the desire to do your will and be your faithful people. For the sake of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ, amen. As you are seated, please silently confess your sins before the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers, you hear our confession. Thank you for those of us that believe in you by faith. Thank you that there is forgiveness in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As our Lord and Savior did during that Easter season, during um, the crucifixion and the resurrection, just as he was raised from the dead, let us now also would you please rise again as he did, as we do every Sunday in our renewal, in our forgiveness, receive these words of comfort from 2 Peter 3. 
The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Amen. Let us now turn and greet one another by saying, the peace of Christ be with you.
please be seated. Welcome once again this morning to Lexington Presbyterian Church. My name is Rick. I'm on staff here, and it is so good to be worshiping together. If you are a first-time guest with us, we want to give you a special welcome. You'll notice on the back of your worship guide, there's a little QR code on the bottom. You can point your camera there. A little link will come up. It'll take you to lexpresschurch.com slash connect. Connect with us. We would love to connect with you. And just a reminder, if you're a member, this is a place where you can also find a group or share up or ask for prayer, or this is an, um, a larger connect card than we've had in the past. So not only for our guests, but for our members as well. Let's be refreshed in our mission this morning. Here it is. We're on mission for God's glory. We're making disciples of Jesus as we worship and as we love and as we serve, you'll find a way to get connected and be on mission with us on the inside cover of your worship guide. We have some updates this morning. Those are at the end of your worship guide, starting on page 17. I'll highlight a couple of them. We really invite you to join our children's ministry team. Sarah Sheely, who served us well, um, she is with child, praise the Lord. And she will be resigning from her position. So we're taking that one part-time 20-hour position and we're breaking it into two 10-hour part-time positions. And I just want to clarify for you, one of those positions is more focused on Wednesday night children's activities and the other one is more focused on Sunday morning children's activities. And you can work out of your home, go back and forth. You get to work with Rebecca and the great children's ministry team. So if you're interested, please email or call Rebecca. You will see her details there. And also VBS, if you would like to come help us set up, we invite you Friday, July 15th at 9 a.m. and Sunday, July 17th, starting at 3 p.m. And keep in mind, if you want to volunteer or serve during VBS, it doesn't have to be for the whole week. You can come for one morning or one hour or whatever you have to offer. Get in touch with Rebecca, and she will welcome your contact. At this point, it is now time for our missions moment, and we get to hear from Caroline Yeaman. Welcome, Caroline. Hi guys, um, as Rick just said, I am Caroline Yeaman, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and I have been attending here at LPC since I was born and have been um, working here as an intern on staff for the last year. Um, I'm here to talk to y'all about my plans to spend um, nine months on mission in Madrid, Spain. Um, before I go into exactly what I'm gonna be doing in Spain, I wanna give you a really brief testimony so you can better understand what um, got me to this point in my life. Um, from a young age, I was raised to love and trust in Jesus um, in every aspect of my life. But as I got older and around ninth grade, I found that more and more difficult to do. Um, I started struggling with a lot of interpersonal problems and family problems. Um, I was really struggling with the weight of my sins and I fell into depression and um, lost a lot of my identity. Um, I didn't know who I was, why I was on this earth. I didn't know if God was real and I honestly didn't really care if he was. Um, thankfully, by the grace of God, someone at this church showed me love and compassion and helped me understand that um, no sin was so great that it could separate me from God. Um, I didn't realize it then, but looking back on it, um, I can see how the Holy Spirit was still working with me, even though I had mostly turned away from him. Um, God never left me. This gave me a newfound energy for life, um, and I still, um, ugh, I still had no idea, though, what I wanted to do for a career. Um, but of course, God did. Um, the Holy Spirit began pushing more, me towards missions. My first response to this calling was no way. I am not smart enough to be a missionary. I don't know the Bible enough. I don't even know all the books of the Bible in order. I can't be a missionary. Um, but of course, God didn't let this stop him. Um, and I ended up applying um, to MTW and got accepted and assigned to Madrid, Spain. So now that you know a bit more about me and where, um, how I got here, um, I'm going to tell you a bit about what I'm going to be doing while I'm in Madrid, Spain. So I'm going to be working alongside some other MTW missionaries and interns um, to help spread the gospel throughout Spain. Um, now you may be wondering, why Spain? Um, aren't they already a Catholic nation? Um, aren't there other countries that need um, missionaries more? And that's what I thought too. Um, but after I did some research, I found out that um, years of political um, abuse in Spain has led to a big mistrust um, of religion, um, especially for the older generations. Um, this mistrust of religion has led to there being only 2% evangelical Christians in Spain 
and only 18.9% practicing Catholics. Um, MTW's goal is to reach the more open younger generations through relation, relational fellowship so that we can in turn spread the word of the gospel to the other generations. Um, in order to accomplish this, we will be doing this through um, different outreach opportunities such as college ministry, children's ministry, art outreach, English outreach, and our church plant. Um, I am currently in the fundraising stage of my mission. I have already met with the missions team here at the church, and they are gracious enough to give me um, some money towards my goal, but I still have a long way to go. go. Um, thank you for everyone who has donated so far, and thank you for everyone who's donated to this church. Um, uh, if you would like to talk to me about ways you can pray for me or um, maybe help fund me, I would love to talk to you. I'm going to be out in the Welcome Center um, after this for probably 20 minutes after. So swing by. I have cards. I'd love to answer any questions you have about Spain or about me. Um, so thank you. And yeah. Thank you, Caroline. You'll be a great missionary. Now we get to give back. It's an act of worship. That's why we give. We have traditional plates that you can take advantage of in the back of the sanctuary as you exit after the service, or you can be high tech. You can go to lexpresschurch.com giving, and all the options are explained there. Let us continue worshiping together this morning. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride with his own blood. Chuck Parker, and I'm one of the pastors here. I want to welcome all of you today. Really, if you see the music team, to thank them uh, and pat them on the back. It's a very, a lot of labor-intensive work that goes into excellent musical aspect of worship. Uh, I'd like to ask you, if you're able, and I really mean if you're able, if you can't stand up and pray, it's okay for you to sit down. Don't feel any pressure, but if you're able, let's stand for prayer. As a family of believers and the guests that are with us, we're, we're glad that you're here. These Sundays we come together are days of rejoicing and joy, uh, what Rick had mentioned in praying. Uh, Andrea Fuller is back for the first time after a long time uh, dealing with cancer and chemotherapy, and we're very thankful for that. We're thankful for Caroline's heart for the gospel to 
fulfill the Great Commission and go. And we have a, a team right now in Reynosa, Mexico, that is across the border uh, doing uh, ministry as well there. But it's also a day of grief. Uh, our brother, John Tagliaferri, uh, passed away last night. And uh, he finished a long battle with um, myelogenous leukemia. And um, so I don't know if John was ever ordained as a deacon, but if not, he should have been. Because those of you who don't know him, I'm sorry, but he was here for a long time, not so much over the last couple of years. <laughs> so we're going to miss him, and we're going to get it together to pray for the things that we just talked about. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can join together as a worshiping community and come into your presence. And we thank you that both in joy and grief, uh, we can know your love for us. We can rest in your love if we are in Christ. Father, we want to thank you for uh, John, for your work of grace in his life, for bringing him to Jesus by your Holy Spirit, for sustaining him and granting him endurance. We thank you for his, his fight to believe the gospel and to believe it to the end. We want to ask you for Deb, his wife, Matthew and Rebecca, their children. Would you pour out your comfort and your love in their lives? Would you sustain them in this time of grief? And Father, we want to ask you as well on the other side that you would fill Caroline with your spirit. We thank you for your work of grace in her life that she's just described, that you didn't leave her alone as an orphan, but you uh, brought her to yourself in a clear way and have, have given her a clarity of vision. So would you bless her? We also want to ask you for the team in Reynosa that you would keep them safe and that you would give them power to uh, bear witness to the risen Christ by deed and word. And we just thank you for your work in our midst in these ways. Lord, uh, we want to ask you as we celebrate uh, our nation's birth tomorrow that you would grant us fresh renewal and revival. Lord, we pray for us as a local church, not just for all churches everywhere as if we have it together and maybe others don't, but would you be working by your Holy Spirit renewal in us that we would have a burning desire to make Christ known to our neighbors and to the ends of the earth. So, Lord, as we turn to your word now, we want to put all of our eggs in the basket of the work of your Spirit uh, Jesus, you have received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and you have, uh, by virtue of your life and death and resurrection, poured out your Spirit upon the church. So we would ask you for a powerful moving of your Spirit in our lives through your Word and in the visible Word of the Supper after preaching. We pray that you would have your way with us fully. Uh, grant us fresh repentance, fresh faith, uh, new joy, um, new delight in your presence. Lord, all these things, uh, no one could imagine how you would apply your word in all different places and all different people's lives right now. But that's what we're asking for, that you would do that with power. Lord, if there are those who have not been given life in Christ here today, we ask you, Holy Spirit, that this would be the time that you would give a new heart new mind and new eyes that they might see and believe and live. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please be seated. So on March 30th, just a couple of months ago, in Fairfax, California, there was an unfortunate homeowner who had problems with their foundation in their house. So they called the foundation people to work on the house, and apparently, the details weren't in the story, the, the foundation repair people got a little bit overzealous in excavating, 
and they excavated underneath all the retaining walls around the house, and the whole thing collapsed. The entire house, it was a, it was a total loss. And I think that gives you a picture of what the Apostle John wants to do for us today is to not have our foundation erode and collapse. We have been preaching through the Apostle John's first letter to churches probably around Ephesus with our theme being that you may know. A big theme within this letter is to know that you know Christ. And uh, today what we're going to see is that John's warning the churches there to not let anyone deceive them to stick with the foundation that they have in Christ. And what he's going to say is that this apostolic version of who Jesus is, it doesn't need any adjustment, addition, or repair. So you, if somebody comes to you with a new Christ, you know, they're digging around something that's going to cause you to collapse. Stick with what you've already heard and what you've already believed. So with that introduction, we want to look at 1 John chapter 2. It's on page 11 in your worship guide. 1 John 2, uh, verses 18 through 27. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Uh, just a translation note here. Uh, abide is a fine translation for this Greek word. I have no objections to it. But we just really don't say, hey, you abide right here, and I'll be back in a minute. We say either you remain or you stay put. So I'm just going to use the word remain all the way through as we go through this. And it's fine. This, this, the translation is good. The three things that I would like to focus on today talking about guarding the foundation that you have in Christ are, are number one, we need to know the hour. And number two, we need to listen to the anointing. And number three, we need to remain in the sun to know the hour, to listen to the anointing, and to remain in the sun. What you see the apostle starting off with here is he says, it's the last hour. Well, now, what can he possibly mean by this, it's the last hour? Because that was probably, you know, A.D., 80, 90, whenever you want to date his letter. Uh, it was in the first century. And so if that was the last hour, how can this be the last hour as well? And I'm just going to assert without a lot of, you know, technical work on it that what John's talking about is that the whole time from the birth of Christ, particularly focused on his death and resurrection, to his second coming is the last hour. And we'll just, we'll start with the resurrection and say, this is the last hour. And what does he mean by that? Well, all the apostles talk this way. You know, the apostle uh, Paul says, uh, the mystery kept hidden for long ages past has now been revealed to, these, to us in these last times. That this whole period of times, it, this whole period of time in which we live is the, la the end times, is the last hour. And so he says, that this is the last hour, and we know we have evidence that it's the last hour. And again, this corresponds to other apostolic writings that, that wolves will arise from among you. He says, because these people have gone out from us, 
who weren't really part of us because if they had been part of us, they would have remained with the apostolic doctrine. Do you remember that the first sermon that we preached in the series, and for those of you who are guests, you'll have to go back and listen to it, that this whole thing is, is the apostle John saying, look, I touched him, I saw him, I heard him, I know that this is the word of life. I'm an apostolic witness, and the church as a whole through the ages is built on this foundation of the apostles and prophets. And he's saying these people have left apostolic doctrine, particularly about Jesus. And so then he starts to talk about Antichrist. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, don't, read, uh, I don't read Christian fiction, and I don't even watch movies like The Omen and all these things. I was looking at all the literary versions of the Antichrist, and uh, they're, they're really numerous, and particularly, I guess, left behind in the 90s. I was in medical school and doing residency in the 90s, so I wasn't reading, like, fiction books or anything like that. But apparently, that's a big cultural thing. And I just want to say to you, the term Antichrist is only used by the Apostle John in his letters, okay? And people have taken that and they've tied it to the man of lawlessness from, from Thessalonians and Paul, and they've tied it to Revelation, and they've made big things about it. And I just want to say, stop it. I don't think you have any textual warrant to make up this big thing. What, what John says here is a few things, that the Antichrist is anyone who's opposing and undermining a true doctrine of who Jesus is, that he is the Christ, that he is the eternal son of God who became flesh, who lived to fulfill the law, who made an atoning sacrifice for the sins of his people, who was buried and then vindicated as the son of God by being raised from the dead. He has poured out his spirit on the church that Pentecost is all one block with his life, death, and resurrection. And now we await for his bodily return when he will gather his people. This is orthodox Christology, and this is the apostolic doctrine, and we're going to say it later as it's codified in the Nicene Creed. And so he's saying, watch out for anybody who's undermining that, anybody who's distracting you from those things. Now, how does this look and what, what does this mean to you? How are you guarding that foundation? Well, I read last night the testimony of a prominent former Christian musician, person who won Dove Awards, person whose songs, many of them you could probably uh, sing yourself. And what the testimony was, I'm trying to keep the gender out of it, what, what the testimony was was something like this. It sounds like this person grew up in an evangelical church, but they got sideways somewhere because uh, what they said was, I saw God the Father as an angry person who was full of wrath towards me because of my sins, and I saw Jesus as the person who intervened to protect me from that wrath by dying and rising, and that I'm on the other side, I'm judicially okay, but God's never going to be like pleased or satisfied with me in any way. Now, half of that is true, right? <laughs> that God the Father judges sin, he has a wrath towards sin, but it's completely, absolutely deficient and wrong in that Christ came out of the love of the Father. What happened in this evangelical background that, that you didn't understand that God so loved the world, people lost in their sins in defiance of God, that out of that he sent his only son. That in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. That it's all flowing out of the love of the Father. And that the Father and the Son agree. And the Holy Spirit executes the work of Christ. You see, so, so this, this Christology, this, this understanding of who Jesus is, includes the Father, it includes the work of the Holy Spirit, and it's an outpouring of love. Is there judgment there? Yes. And I, and I went on to, to find that she, that she had, I'm going to just go ahead, she had given up an orthodox view of penal substitutionary atonement, and there was an antichrist just right there available to lead her on into a kind of universalism. You see how this happens? I didn't see anybody nod. Do you see how this happens? 
like these defects in your understanding of the person of Jesus, the eternal son of God who became flesh, fully God, fully man, who fulfilled the law, who was crucified for sinners, bearing God's judgment of death for sin, was buried and vindicated as the son of God by being raised to life and is exalted to the right hand of the father. How long did it take me to say that? Like 45 seconds? It's not really a big body of material. And it's what we have to stick with against antichrist. Now, we have some maybe antichrists um, that are closer to home. Uh, you would want to be co-opted out to be Jesus the Republican. Okay? Not Jesus, the eternal son of God, who lived to fulfill God's law, who was crucified, buried, and raised to life. Jesus, my political associate. Or you could be Jesus the Democrat, right? I just read uh, the summary of an article by a lady from the Washington Post, and she wants to make Jesus a Democrat. And there's nothing new about this. Jesus the structuralist philosopher, Jesus the existentialist, Jesus the whoever I get to make him after my own image. And, and all of those are eroding this apostolic doctrine of who Christ is that's very clear from the, the book of 1 John. He's the one that's the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He's the eternal son of God. He's the eternal word of life. And so it could even be for you, I'm going to change my doctrine and my understanding of who Jesus is because surely he wants me to be happy. You just need to know ahead of time if you're struggling right now with some sin that's going to drag you away from Christ, and when I say a sin, I mean a clear running through the stop sign of one of the Ten Commandments, and you're going to go on in that. When we come and sit down or when your friends come and sit down and talk to you and say, you're clearly walking away from the faith, you're, you're, gonna, you're not allowed to say, Jesus just wants me to be happy. I've had someone within the recent past say to me, I was really hoping that you would say to me that Jesus loves me no matter what, and that when I run, blow through this stop sign, it won't make any difference. You see, this is a defective. Jesus is King and Lord, and he's the judge of all the earth. And what he gives in eternal life by the power of the Holy Spirit is the ability to repent and turn away from sin and turn back to him. Sinners are always welcome. If that's you today and you're about to run through a bunch of stop signs, this is your invitation to turn back and be loved by the Father and welcomed as a son or daughter to believe his atonement. Let somebody know about it. Don't run headlong through it. Because you can't make him into your image. And you can't make him to fit the paradigm that you want for your purpose to, to do what you want to do. And so just want to pause there for a minute and say that our point here is you've got to know the hour. You've got to know the hour. And to know the hour, you've got to know, are you on the foundation of the Son as we have presented him, as he's been preached this day? So I want to say to our covenant children, are you going, is today the day that, that you believe and trust on this Christ, crucified, raised, exalted to save sinners? For those of you who are, are moving through your teen years and out and you're, you're being emancipated from your parents and you're going through the kinds of things that Caroline was courageous enough to say, how do I work this out and make this my own? And maybe you're in deep water. Well, one of the beautiful things that she did was let somebody know about it. Bring, bring a, a trusted person in on it that can walk with you. But... but have Christ, have Jesus. And, you know, the, the, the church is full of stories of people who've sat in pews for 20 years, 25 years, looking like church members, who then the Holy Spirit takes at a moment like, like this and gives them true saving faith. And they say, I, I was never on this foundation. So you want to be sure that you're on this foundation of Christ. And I just want to then advise that 
this text is saying, do you expect antichrist? And there is a singular antichrist here. There may be a person out there somewhere who's going to encapsulate all this. I'm going to put that all aside, okay? But there are antichrists out there who want to erode your foundation. Are you prepared for the fight? Yeah, do, do you see that you, when, when you hear somebody coming with uh, an obtuse version of who, who Jesus is, it's not on track. Are you going to be surprised and shocked when you find out that, that leaders in the church, uh, by their behavior, have not had an orthodox version of Jesus? Is that going to undermine and unsettle everything? You need to understand that this is a war. And he says later on in 1 John, it's the spirit of the Antichrist. There are spiritual beings. There's a spiritual reality behind this that wants to devour people. So a simple way, an easier shortcut way to say this is to say it the way Jesus said it. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Don't just be asleep. Wake up. Understand. And that, that brings us to the point is, what is distracting you these days? What is distracting you from a pure and simple devotion to Christ as he is presented in the gospel? And I would just say for myself, you know, I think one of the biggest distractions that we have is political, cultural issues. And for myself, I can spend, I can see something on the news and get inflamed about it and spend two days going down a path like this that, that makes me angry and it doesn't bear the fruit of the Spirit. And it, there's nothing wrong with acknowledging those things and maybe you're supposed to be involved with them. But I think the majority of us and, and all of us actually really need to come back to say, am I sticking on my foundation of Christ crucified and raised and is this, the, is this the subject of my speech and my heart to other people? And you could just ask yourself, what do I talk about? It could be political, cultural issues. It could be your health. It could be your health. I'm just smiling because I'm 63 now. I think I'm 63. And my hip hurts. Like I had an MRI in my hip. And nobody can tell me there's anything wrong with my hip but I can't sleep on that side. And if you let me go, I'll talk to you about it all day long. <laughs> In fact, I'm talking to you about it right now. And it, it doesn't seem to be going away. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with me acknowledging that my hip hurts. But what's, what's the food of my soul? Am I distracted? Lord, Lord, give me a painless life. Okay, let's, let's move on then. So that's know the hour, know the fight that's going on. And then the second thing that we have here is uh, listen to the anointing. And in two different places here, he says, you have been anointed by the Holy One, and we're going to take that to mean Jesus, and you all have knowledge. We come back to knowing. And then he says down the line down here, verse 27, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no one uh, no need that anyone should teach you. And we're just going to comment on this whole issue of anointing. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, anointing came with oil for the priests and others. It was empowerment, symbolic of the Holy Spirit to empower them for ministry. In Isaiah 61, we heard today that the Spirit of the Lord would anoint the Messiah. And Jesus picks up that text in Luke 4 in the synagogue, and he stands up and he reads Isaiah 61. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is, a, is upon me, and he has anointed me to preach good news. And then at the end, he says, this text is now fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus is preeminently the final anointed one. And what you want to understand from the language here is that Christos, the, the name for Christ, Messiah, Messiah means the anointed one. And then Creo, to, to anoint, uh, is uh, the same kind of root. And then Chrisma, to be anointed, they're, they're all sort of one word group together. And what does that mean for you? What that means is that at Pentecost, the anointed one, crucified and raised, received the promise of the Father that he poured out forever on the church. And Pentecost is inseparable from the cross. And so that, that anointing, this empowering by the Holy Spirit, comes to everyone who believes. 
And so when you look at this, he's writing this out to the churches indiscriminately. If you are in Christ, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and that gives you knowledge. And that knowledge, we want to say, is not an esoteric knowledge, and we'll come back to this when we illustrate it. It's not some thing out there. You, I've, I've been around people before who said, I don't need anybody to teach the Bible. I don't need to be in worship. I don't need any kind of doctrinal structure. I just listen to the Holy Spirit. I have an anointing. And you can just see that that's just like a plan for disaster. This anointing by the Holy Spirit brings you back when you're listening to it what does it bring you back to jesus it brings you back to the fundamental message of first john what was all this about jesus said to them the law and the prophets and the psalms all have the same message that the christ would suffer he'd be raised from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all nations beginning at jerusalem that's the theme of the bible old new that's the foundation of the apostles and prophets with christ jesus himself being the cornerstone so there's not some esoteric secret out there that brings some different kind of anointing the anointing of the holy spirit is him teaching you to remain bible-centered and gospel-centered around a crucified and risen savior it's it has a very it has a very sharp focus now there's a big I don't know what else to say except penumbra. There's a big wake behind that point, but you can't lose the point. So do you want to, do you want to experience and know the anointing of the Holy Spirit? It's going, to bring back, it's going to bring you back to the Bible and a Christ-centered view of the Bible. And so I just went out there and hunted around a little bit for some straw people to beat up and uh, by way of illustration. Uh, you know, and I don't mind naming one of them, Benny Hinn. He has a big book about the anointing. And uh, I listened to a little bit of this stuff. And it's just all out there. You go out there somewhere and you have this kind of secret thing that happens. And then you're able to take off your coat and wave it. And people fall down and things like that. Now, I, I want, let's just put that aside. Uh, I want to say that there are seasons and periods where people are clearly filled with the Holy Spirit for effective ministry. I mean, that's kind of what revival is all about. I don't want to belittle that. I don't want to say anything bad about it. But what John's talking here uh, is not that kind of special filling with the Spirit for some ministerial thing. He's talking about the Spirit teaching you truth. It's not a lie that brings you back to Jesus. So the point of this part of the sermon is listen to that anointing. And the one other thing that I have a gripe about out there in sort of broad evangelical culture is that there seems to be this idea, even for people who are more Christ-centered, that you seek this anointing, I don't know how to describe it, for success. Either success in ministry or success in something else. And, and we want to come back and say that the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life his power for ministry and life is always and irrevocably demonstrated in weakness. Really important. Just invoke Paul here for a second in, in the last half of Romans 8. The whole creation's groaning. The world, the flesh, and the devil are out there. It's a fight. You're going to suffer and your body's going to decay. It's going to be hard. But you have an anointing from the Holy One that empowers you. And the glory of it is that it's especially seen in weakness. Now, I didn't mean to invoke Paul too much there, but I think we have to bring him in at this point. And so here's the question for today again. We come back to the same thing. Do you believe and do you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit teaching you and reminding you of apostolic doctrine of who Christ is and who you are through the word. I, you want to be honest with yourself. What's been going on in your head and in your life? And I would say again for myself, I can spend days out there running down some rabbit trail. Without, without the joy, the consolation. Remember, uh, the Apostle Paul says, if there's any, if there's any comfort in the love of, of, of Christ... 
If there's any fellowship with the Holy Spirit, where is this consolation and comfort, fellowship with the Holy Spirit coming from in your life? And how is it leading you back again to faith and repentance and the humility of love for other people? That's what we're going to see in the, in the rest of John. There's a sharp point to this. And, and I think the whole point of this is that we can be distracted and, and take trails that we don't want to go down and we find the foundation eroding over time. The material of the Spirit's anointing is our weakness. And I think we want to say that over and over again. So are you listening to the anointing? Do you know the hour? Do you understand that it's going to be a fight? And then are you listening to the Spirit point you back to Jesus, crucified and raised over and over again? And I think I would just emphasize here, uh, pointing you back to our union with Christ. And we'll, we'll move on now then to say the third point is that he says, remain in the Son. Abide or remain in the Son. And what you see uh, and I got this from Robert Yarborough. Uh, he, he did the math, and you can, you can quibble with him if it's wrong. But this word for abide or remain, I'm going to say remain, it's used 11 times in this second chapter and 16 times in chapter 3 and then 13 times in chapter 4. So next to knowing, which I think has 48 references, remaining has the, the second substantive number. And it kind of goes up in a peak. It starts at the beginning of the book, and it's going to peak out in the next chapter and then begin to de decline. So clearly with the Apostle John, it's very important to him for the people of God to hear, remain in Christ, stay put, put your roots down in Jesus, uh, abide, so to speak. And if you look at the concordance between John's gospel and this letter, uh, you find this, this wonderful uh, aspect that at the Last Supper in the upper room discourse, John records Jesus saying, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit and show yourselves to be my disciple. It's like the universal promise. It's the promise for, for all of life, for fruit bearing in Christ. And he says, if you don't remain in me, you'll be cut off and thrown into the fire with other branches. So, so this idea of remaining in Christ is very important. Now, for those of you who've been around for a while, one of the reasons I'm changing abiding to remaining is because if you look at some of the old literature, I really believe that it's skewed in a certain way that... Um, I wake up in the morning and I go, Jesus, I've been joined to you by faith. Uh, I'm a son of the Father. You've given me your Holy Spirit. I want to abide in you. When I close my, the door to my bedroom and leave this time of prayer, uh, I want to walk in, in, in unbroken fellowship with you. And Lord, if, if you're gracious today, it would last for five minutes. You know? And then you get out there at three minutes and you, you've already forgotten about it. And there, there's sort of a pathway within certain views of this that you can kind of get kicked up into the abiding plane where you have uninterrupted fellowship with Christ and even you don't sin anymore, or at least don't sin volitionally anymore. And, and it's just not the case, all right? It's not the case. What we want to say is that you're, you're, abide, you're remaining in Christ you're, you're resting in him both for forgiveness and life because you've been united with him. And you may go through a whole day with your conscience completely clear of any sin and you would have forgotten all the sins of omission that you didn't do. How many of you are like me, you can walk by 30 people and it would never bother your conscience at all. You need your wife with you. You need Shelly with you to say, aren't you going to stop and help that person? And you say, oh, it never entered my mind. It didn't raise to the level of, of, of my conscience. So this, this abiding, we're not going to turn into perfection. And it also, I think, sometimes is, if I'm abiding in Christ, I become a Greek stoic. Nothing can faze me. I'm joined to Christ. Uh, the whole world can fall down, and I'll just stand here and go, praise the Lord and stuff. And you just don't get that picture of who Jesus is. Now, walking with Christ and remaining in Christ brings the fruit of the Spirit, and we really want to emphasize that and stick with it. But we'll, we'll move on now. So I just want to illustrate this a little bit. What does it mean in, in John's terms 
around the time of the first century to remain in Christ. Uh, again, I think that um, because we're Western and we're far away, things look really different from us. And I just want to tell you about Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna. Uh, Polycarp was the bishop in churches that were around this area. And um, Polycarp was the, the, the top dog in the church. And at that time, they had put to death a guy named Germanicus. And he had been put in the arena with wild beasts and torn to pieces. Uh, and they said to Polycarp, uh, you're next. So he moves outside the city just a little bit to a farm. He doesn't really run away, but he doesn't just sort of roll over and say, come get me. So they have to hunt for him. They hunt for him, and eventually they find him. And Polycarp has been out in a farmhouse outside the city of Smyrna, spending his time praying, knowing that, that his life was near an end. Uh, he actually, as he was praying, became convinced that he was going to be burned alive. And when the policeman, and this is very important in our cultural milieu and, and where we are, when the policeman soldiers came to get him, he said to the farm owner, will you sit these men down and give them a full meal, bring them everything they want to eat and drink, and he served them there. And he, ate, he actually ate with them there. And then after he was finished and they were ready to go, he said, do you mind if I pray? And so Polycarp, according to the history, stood up and prayed out loud in the presence of, of his persecutors for two hours. For two hours, he prayed for the church, for his enemies, for everything else. And then he said, okay, let's go. And they took him down to the arena, uh, to the proconsul. And the proconsul said, hey, Polycarp, you're an old man. Why don't you just deny Christ just for a minute and make an offering to Caesar and say, Caesar's Lord, we don't really want to, we don't want to feed an old man to the wild beast. And Polycarp said, you basically can save your words. Uh, feed me to the wild beast. He said, okay, uh, I'm going to threaten you with something else since you're willing to be eaten by wild beasts. We're going to burn you alive. And so Polycarp said, this is what I was thinking was going to happen. And this was his quote to the proconsul uh, that he said. He said, for 80 and six years, I have been Jesus' servant, and he has done me no wrong. And how can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And with that, they wanted to nail him to a stake uh, so that he could be burned. And he said, you don't need to nail me here. It's fine. Just tie my hands. And he was, he was burned alive. What was, was Polycarp remaining in Christ? You see, this was the big issue in that first couple of centuries of the church. Will you confess Christ to the end? And this is what the Apostles' Creed is for, isn't it? that when I'm put on trial, I will confess Christ to the very end. So what does that mean for you and for me? What that means is uh, when you're at the family Thanksgiving dinner and people bring up all the political stuff, the social stuff and cultural things, and, you know, what do you think? What do you have to say about this? Well, the first and primary thing that you want to say, and maybe you don't even go any further, is that I belong to Jesus Christ, body and soul. He was, he's the eternal son of God who was born in the flesh, who was crucified for sinners, who was buried and raised to life. I have entrusted myself to him as savior. He's my king and Lord, and he's going to show himself Lord over all things. This is my confession. This is my primary concern. Do you believe? There is a judgment day coming when every person will stand before Christ and before his throne, give an account for their relationship or lack thereof with him. So how this open confession, how is it maintained? Well, I would say by the normal means of grace. You're ingesting the Bible for yourself. You're listening to the anointing uh, of the Holy Spirit. You're listening to him teach you. You're in fellowship with other people. You're here for corporate worship. And I want to applaud you all that this is part of the means of grace for you to endure and remain in Christ to the end. There's joy and peace in it. Even though I've emphasized suffering and weakness, there's joy and peace in Christ, just like Polycarp had when he was arrested. 
And so we're going to come now to the Lord's Supper. And for those of you who are online, there'll be probably an abrupt ending to this. And we want to invite you to come and take the Lord's Supper with us. But this is a visible, physical sermon of everything that we have talked about today. And it is a means of abiding and remaining. And Andrew's going to introduce the Lord's Supper in a minute, but I'm just going to take my shot at it. It's not only a sign that signifies that Jesus' body was broken for sinners and his blood poured out. It is a sign and it is a remembrance in that way. We see it, we taste it, but it's also a seal. The anointing of the Holy Spirit, Jesus has prescribed to fill you and console you as you eat with him. And this is what's unique about Reformed and Presbyterian views of the Lord's Supper, and I want to trumpet it. It's not a bare memorial. It's a real meeting with the risen Christ for those who believe that the Holy Spirit really feeds and strengthens them. And so you, as a pastor, as an elder, you grieve over people who are out without the Lord's Supper. You, you're not going to have the Lord's Supper at Starbucks. But you're here. <laughs> Sorry. You're here, so I won't cajole you. I'm glad you're here. And what we're going to do in just a few minutes is, is come and feast with Jesus. And the, this, I'll summarize this way. This is the promise that he made to us, verse 25, even eternal life. Christ has been raised, the first fruits of the whole harvest. If you are in Christ, you have been raised with him. And I love the phrase of Dick Gaffin. You'll never be more alive from the dead in your inner man than you are right now. This is what he's promised to us, eternal life now and eternal life forever for those whose lives are built on the foundation of Christ. I just want to go back again to, to, to get you to think about all the distractions. John Tagliaferri was stuck on a vent for a week, and last night they had to extubate him and let him pass away. I think during these last, this last week, he wasn't concerned about cultural, political, social matters or anything. What he needed and what he had with a fight, it was a fight was knowledge of Christ crucified and raised. And so now he gets to behold Jesus face to face in his soul. And we long for the day for Christ's return when his body will be raised and joined together for eternal life forever. Know the hour, listen to the anointing, Remain in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this word. And we pray, Lord, that you would write these things in our hearts. And that we might be filled with your Holy Spirit. Even now as we, we take of the supper, that you would meet with your people. And Lord, again, if there are those who haven't been given life yet, we, we pray that this would be the time for new faith and new repentance. So meet with us around your supper, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, uh, this is Pastor Andrew, and I wanted to take a few moments to address those of you who are joining us for the live stream who will be unable to participate with us in the Lord's Supper. I first of all wanted to say that there is a lot of sadness in this for for us as pastors and then for the, the larger body here at LPC. The Lord's Supper is a family meal and when we gather as a family, whether that's here at church uh, or it could be a family gathering over Thanksgiving dinner, when someone's not there, we miss them. So we miss you and we long for you to be back at the table for the family meal. Um, but I wanted to take a few moments to just speak pastorally about, well, what can you do? Uh, the first thing I wanted to say is that um, Scripture gives us a place to take 
this longing, this sadness, and uh, we can go to places like the Psalms of Lament that give language to this frustration we feel that we want to be there, but we, we can't for these various health reasons and other risks involved. So I encourage you to, to take these longings, to take the sorrow to God, to take it to his word and to find a voice there and uh, know that we are joining with you in that. Um, we go forward with the Lord's Supper um, knowing that there's this tension that we are celebrating the supper here in person, but also we're missing many of our family members around the table. So uh, as a pastor and I'm representing the other staff, we're grieving this. And I um, also wanted to say that um, something you can do uh, is to turn your focus towards um, others. Um, reach out to uh, some others during this time. Um, while we're gathering here, um, take a few moments to call someone who also might be on the live stream and, and chat with them, process this with them, pray with them. The Lord's Supper is a meal for, for God's family. It's an embodied meal. So uh, when the bread and wine are broken, the words of institution are given. Uh, God works through it by his spirit. Um, so we, we long for you to be here to experience uh, his grace at the table. Um, but the Lord's Supper also gives us a posture towards uh, the future. It points us to the wedding feast of the Lamb in Revelation where we'll all be gathered without masks, without pre-existing conditions, without any risk. Uh, and so take this time right now and what you're feeling and um, orient your gaze towards that wedding supper of the Lamb. Uh, if you're in Christ, then you can take great confidence that one day, there will be no more restrictions. So um, lean into that. Um, we do long to see you. We miss you. We love you. And uh, have a great rest of your Lord's Day.